let's start. Welcome, um, dear Professor Walzer, dear Michael, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you and to have you at uh, Sciences Po and very grateful that you accepted our invitation. Many thanks to the Sciences Po staff, Gaël and Jérôme. I think Gaël disappeared. Um, my colleagues, of course, Ariel Kolonomos, Annabel Lieber, and Amélie, who has been a wonderful companion in preparing your stay in Paris. So thank you very much, uh, Amélie. We usually gather in smaller settings and go over the introductory part rather fast, but I thought that you deserved some more words. I promise I won't be too long. <coughs> it's impossible anyway to quote all your books or close to 40 and all your articles, several hundred. Okay, so Michael Walzer has written and writes extensively on a wide range of subjects as a political activist and a public intellectual for Dissent, namely the review he co-edited for the New Republic, the New Review of Books and other journals, and as an intellectual to cool. I'm mentioning this dual identity Firstly, out of utter jealousy, despite France's rich history and engaged intellectuals, they seem to have vanished from our landscape. Secondly, because in your case, the voyage from one style, it's really more about style, not content to the other, from public interventions to academic work, is not only seamless, but also reflects your political agenda and involvement. Many of your subjects have been tested either on students or on general audiences before appearing in academic book form. Thirdly, because the articles or books I would like to comment on very briefly here are examples in a sense of what political commitment, social criticism, and political theory are supposed to be. Criticism must be existential, as Schlar would say, led from within with courage, as you say, compassion, and a good eye. Our audience today is, I believe, familiar with, most familiar with three strands of your work. Your writings on war and just war theories, which include obligations, essays on, essays on disobedience, war and citizenship, World War II, why was this war different, and most importantly, just and unjust wars, a moral argument with historical illustrations, followed then by arguing about war. I should probably also mention your famous and debated article about political action and dirty hands, and the many texts about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as well as the ones on revolutions of the saints and of the tyrants, on religious <coughs> repression and revolutionary purges. They belong, I would say, to the same genre, the same worry about violence and political morality. And as always, your approach is at once theoretical and historical empirical. Second area of research uh, is concerned with equality, redistribution, justice, and the meaning of social cooperation, with in defense of equality, for example, but mostly spheres of justice, my personal favorite, and many other texts. In spheres, you defend complex equality or coherent egalitarianism by providing arguments for just domestic redistribution, not according to universal principles, but according to the value of the goods to be distributed. Each sphere has its own criteria for just distribution, and among these, importantly, membership, but also divine grace, education, and recognition. The book has been widely discussed alongside or in the aftermath of Rawls's theory of justice and within the Team L, Team C championship the liberals versus the communitarians. You landed on the side of the communitarians or the liberal nationalists or the soft multiculturalists, sometimes even of the relativists. I think that Spears is the clearest account of your understanding of political communities in which belonging, loyalty, solidarity, identity, and shared meanings play a crucial role. Interestingly, Spheres and Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia were the results, so to speak, of a seminar you taught together at the Harvard Philosophy Department, which must have been quite an experience for the students. Spheres and other texts such as Liberalism and the Art of Separation, where liberalism, I quote, is a world of walls and each one creates a new liberty, probably led you to rethink about pluralism in general and 
the summa divisio between universalism and localism in particular, and also about urgent questions such as nationalism, ethnicity, and identity. So liberalism, social democracy, social criticism, and the relationship between universalism and particularism is the third strand of your work that our audience is probably familiar with. And I would include your text on social criticism from within your understanding of a local version of universalism here. I believe that the kind of social criticism you're committed to is particularly important in these areas where, I quote you, you call on your people to live up to their highest ideals with, again, courage, compassion, and a good eye. But this can only be done from the inside with shared meanings as a starting point. This is also why you prefer interpretation over discovery or invention in moral philosophy. Outside and from above views always are, in a sense, closures of meaning, potentially oppressive. Therefore, philosophers retain no special authority. You say they remain civilians. So openness, never-ending arguments allow for revisions of comparative morality, tradition, and culture without fundamentally undoing them. In short, every specific community with its thick idiosyncratic values bears lessons for the thin values of universalism. This also means, I think, that you are sensitive to time, the slow and steady time of the social democrats, the fast and potentially brutal pace of the revolutionaries, and in between, the agents of social change at the margins, the insurgent movements who can be acknowledged only in a free society. This is part of the paper you're going to present in a minute. I will conclude by saying that there's yet another very important part of your work, the one some argue that allows to make sense of the rest, Jewish thought. I had the pleasure of publishing your Universalism and Jewish Values, the translation thereof, in an issue of Raison Politique in 2001. And your last publications here include In God's Shadow, Politics in the Hebrew Bible, and the three volumes, well, the third one is coming out in these months, um, with Yale University Press, uh, with your co-authors, Menachem Lobabaum and Noam Zohar, on the Jewish um, political tradition the subtitles being authority, membership, and uh, community. You have, since your bar mitzvah on Exodus 32, worked on the Hebrew Bible as a source of inspiration. On its internal pluralism, the, I quote, almost democracy of Israelite religious culture, although not concerned with politics or political theory, as, as you say, there is no political theory in the Hebrew Bible on the necessity of argument about law, justice, and history, precisely because of the contradictions between codes and the lack of definitive answers, but within a community of shared meanings. This endeavor, I think, is important not only for the Bible scholar, the community member, or the political theorist, but for the social critic of the day. The poor transmission of left-wing ideals, secular, and the probably too literal transmission of religious values among the conservatives, in other words, leaving the religious tradition to the conservatives and stripping the left from its religious inheritance, is, you believe, you argue, a bad strategy, especially in contemporary Israel. Sharing a living tradition, on the other hand, may be the beginning of a solution. I will end with two quotes. Your work on Christian just war theory has led you to say in an interview that Israelis need Catholic just war theory, which reminded me of this British ambassador to Israel or Egypt maybe in the 50s who said, but this is probably apocryphal, if only Arabs and Jews would learn to resolve their conflicts like good Christians. <laughs> on the other hand, in the same way Israelis need Christian just war theory, the Jewish prophets, you say, have to go to school with the Greeks. Interesting. And I will end here with one last sentence. Leon Wieseltier said about Irving Howe, your mentor and the founder of Dissent, he lived in three worlds, literary, political, and Jewish. And he watched all of them change almost beyond recognition. I believe this may well apply to you too. So thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. Very good.
grateful for that introduction. You now know a great deal about me. Um, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming here and for your willingness to listen to me in the English language. Um, I uh, am going to talk about freedom and equality and argue, uh, despite the question mark, that they can indeed stand together, but not uh, as they are often understood on both the right and the left. Uh, these are two of the most contested concepts in political thought, but the relation between them isn't, in my view, contested enough. It's a fairly common belief that freedom and equality are in conflict, or at least that there's a tension between them such that any human society must be either more free or more equal. And the argument for a conflict of this sort has two versions, a left-wing and a right-wing version, the left preferring more equal, the right more free. Each of these accounts of the conflict is partly right, but mostly wrong. And I will begin with, with the left story, which has been brought forward very often in the history of revolutionary politics. Indeed, I began thinking about this lecture and began writing it during the months last year when we were marking the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution. It's especially important for my own political project to convince you that the left version of the claim that freedom and equality are incompatible is indeed mostly wrong. I take my cue from a sentence of Albert Camus. I think it's from the rebel. The great event of the 20th century was the forsaking of the values of freedom by the revolutionary movements. A powerful sentence. I would add not only the 20th century, for the Jacobins in the 18th century were the first revolutionary movement to forsake the value of freedom. Revolutionary movements have again and again produced tyrannical regimes and sustained them with brutality and terror. But how can this be, given what men and women on the left imagine the word revolution to mean? We expect a new birth of freedom, as well as the creation of a society of equals. But the revolutionary defense of tyranny starts from an insistence that these two expectations do not go together. You probably know the argument. Some of you may have made the argument. For many people on the left have defended or apologized for leftist tyrants and terrorists. In France's Maoist moment in the 1960s, there were indeed lively and engaged defenders of freedom, even of radical versions of freedom. And yet at the same time, there was also a great admiration for one of the most brutal tyrants in world history. So here is the argument that commonly accompanies that kind of admiration. The entrenched power of the powers that be, the strength of hierarchical structures, the long history of deference on one side and arrogance on the other, all this can only be challenged by the battering ram of a strong state. And in practice, that means a tyrannical state. It means a state that breaks through all the legal and constitutional constraints of the old regime, postpones the revolution's promise of a new regime, calls off elections or allows only one party to field candidates, and then locks up any comrades who complain about what is happening. And all this on the way to equality. By contrast, the argument continues. Men and women with qualms about tyranny, soft-spoken liberals and timid social democrats will never succeed in creating an egalitarian society. They lack the rough energy, the necessary brutality. They will compromise endlessly and never reach the radical transformation they pretend to support. 
it will take a determined vanguard, a maximal leader, to destroy the old social order. Equality on this view requires the suspension, it's always said to be temporary, of such bourgeois civil liberties as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right of opposition, the rule of law. Once the revolution begins, the ruling maxim must be all opposition is counter-revolutionary. A visitor to Cuba in 1960, shortly after the revolution there, illustrates this maxim. He was writing in Dissent magazine. The jails have filled with political prisoners and the government insists that people be clear, clear, that is 100% for everything it does. The insistence on that kind of clarity is a revolutionary commonplace. Another argument connects with this one and perhaps underlies it. The achievement of equality cannot be the result of a political campaign that respects democratic freedoms because the demos, the people, don't yet understand the value of equality. Many of them can't imagine themselves the equals of their masters. They won't rally to the egalitarian cause. To be sure, they are capable of occasional uprisings, uh, as in the medieval Jacqueries, driven by a moment of insight, nicely exemplified by a 14th century English couplet, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? But most often it's all too clear who the gentlemen are and who all the others are. Medieval serfs and modern industrial workers and women throughout history all have grown up in a world of hierarchy. They are accustomed to the routines and they know the language of hierarchy. They have been taught that inequality is natural or that it is divinely ordained it has been a feature of their everyday life. They are the victims of false consciousness. The theory of false consciousness lies at the root of the argument for vanguard rule. For what distinguishes the vanguard and entitles it to seize power and govern without opposition is its possession of true consciousness. The English social theorist Stuart Hall sardonically but accurately sums up the argument, quote, whereas they, the people, are the dupes of history, we, the enlightened, are somehow without a trace of illusion. It's the confidence by, it's the confidence produced by knowing the truth without a trace of illusion that gives the vanguard the determination it needs to break the existing order and to use whatever force is necessary for the task. I'm not going to try to describe how vanguards are embodied or replaced by maximal leaders like Stalin, Mao, or Pol Pot. These two, vanguards and maximal leaders, are similar versions of tyrannical rule. I want to ask instead, are rulers of this kind really necessary to, or even conducive to, the achievement of equality? Do we, who value equality, need them? And as most of you probably know, I'm going to argue that they are neither necessary nor conducive. But in making this argument, I won't focus on the fact that vanguards and maximal leaders don't, over the long haul, bring us equality, th though they don't. I want to argue instead that they do bring us an instant realization of inequality. Well, uh, instant may be too strong. There usually is a moment of revolutionary joy when everyone is a fellow citizen or a comrade. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, William Wordsworth wrote of 1789, but to be young was very heaven. Wordsworth's bliss didn't last long, however, and the moment of camaraderie is brief. It's succeeded by the rapid establishment of new hierarchical structures, all powerful bureaucracies, the natural and in inevitable result of the suspension 
of political freedom. <clears throat> the first inequality of the revolutionary regime is the inequality of knowledge. The new rulers hold what we used to call the correct ideological position, and the ruled have to be taught what to think. So all the means of communication and all the means of education have to be seized and run by those who are clear about the official line. But the greater inequality is the inequality of political power. The rulers have overwhelming power and the ruled are powerless. Equally powerless, equally powerless, I can see the leveling effect of revolutionary tyranny. The tyrant or the vanguard, together with the new apparatchiks, stand above a mass of powerless men and women. I concede again that the revolutionary regime, since it is after all a left regime, does lift up the poorest members of society, at least for a while. Populist rulers in Latin America have sponsored public works, raised the minimum wage, and poured money into food and rent subsidies until the money runs out. And then the poor are poor again, and the maximal leader replaces largesse with repression. Communist dictatorships in Eastern Europe established a basic welfare state, though always with special privileges for party members, and they provided job security in factories commonly ruled by incompetent party militants. In neither case were the workers allowed to form independent unions or political parties to defend their interests as they conceived those interests. The immediate establishment of political inequality is plainly visible for those willing to look, but it is rarely discussed in revolutionary literature which is focused on economic and social inequality. It may be true, may be true, that only rulers with absolute power can abolish aristocratic privilege and confiscate corporate wealth. With a series of decrees ruthlessly enforced, they can disestablish feudalism, they can nationalize the capitalist economy, abolish private property and land, and all other means of production. And then Marx teaches us we must be on the road to a society of equals because political inequality is merely a reflection of economic inequality. Abolish the one and the other will fall. Even if we use state power to create economic e equality, that creation will over time produce the withering away of the state. But if that's what Marx actually believed, he was seriously wrong as we have learned many times over. Political inequality is freestanding, autonomous, and it always generates new inequalities throughout the social order. These new inequalities will be harder to overcome because of the revolutionary regime's claim to the peculiar legitimacy that comes from true knowledge, <clears throat> and also from its supposed commitment to use that knowledge to create an egalitarian society. <clears throat> the task of the intelligentsia, Lenin once wrote long ago, is to make leaders from the intelligentsia unnecessary. But once the all-knowing intellectuals have declared themselves necessary to the task of making themselves unnecessary, it is very hard to persuade them that the task is completed and their time has passed. They cling to power exactly as their predecessors did. And those of us opposed to the regime who refuse to be clear will not be recognized as having any legitimacy at all. Soon we will be dissidents hiding from the secret police. And that is an unequal relationship of a very dangerous kind. It's true enough that liberal and social democratic rulers legitimized by consent rather than true knowledge will not be able to overcome the entrenched hierarchies as quickly or as completely as the revolutionary vanguard or the maximal leader. 
But um, please note that the feudal hierarchy was abolished here in the first years of the French Revolution before the Jacobin seizure of power. So my last assertion requires some qualification. Liberals and social democrats have to move relatively slowly because they depend on the agreement of people who aren't fully committed to the correct ideological position. Nonetheless, political activists in what we might think of as the Girondin Menshevik rather than the Jacobin Bolshevik tradition have sometimes succeeded in reducing inequality in the economic sphere without creating inequality in the political sphere. <clears throat> and that's an achievement that we ought to value, even if it takes time, even if it is subject to reversal, and even if it never brings anything like absolute equality. Liberals and social democrats use the regulatory powers of the democratic state when they control the state against hierarchies of birth and wealth. Equally important, they help to create and sustain a lively and open civil society whose associations independently of the state can contest the power of the powers that be. The key example in the history of social democracy is the countervailing power of labor unions. The result of state regulation and associational countervailance is, or, or can be, or might be, a society that is more egalitarian than what came before, and at the same time, more free. This is a version, I suppose it's a modest version, of what we on the left expect from a revolution but will conceivably get only from revolutionaries of a very particular kind, who would adopt a bill of rights that they mean to live by, who would confront counter-revolution with the rule of law rather than with terror, and who would commit themselves to the slow grind of democratic politics. Taken together, this program is frequently called reformist, but that word in our current political vocabulary understates the significance and moral value of the possible, sometimes the actual, alternatives to revolutionary tyranny. So let me put the argument more strongly. If we focus on power and powerlessness, the politics of liberal democracy and social democracy is more transformative than any tyrannical politics. Tyranny, even when the tyrants call themselves leftists, commonly leads to an outcome nicely captured in a few lines from the Irish poet William Butler Yeats. Hurrah for revolution and more cannon shot. A beggar upon horseback lashes a beggar on foot. Hurrah for revolution and cannon come again. The beggars have changed places, but the lash goes on. It's not that political freedom guarantees a society of equals, obviously it doesn't. But it makes it possible to fight for a society of equals. And that fight for all those who join it is a first realization of equality. While the dictatorship of the proletariat or any other revolutionary dictatorship is near instant inequality. Revolutionary history teaches us, and universal history confirms the teaching, that there is a steady tendency in all human societies to produce and reproduce hierarchy. As Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, wrote long ago, people everywhere, leftists and revolutionaries also, pursue power after power, riches, honor, and command as he wrote, wealth, fame, and political office. Enough people get what they want to create all the inequalities that we know about and live with. And what is more important, these same people do their best to pass on whatever power they win to their children, some of whom lose the power they have inherited while others grow their power and pass it on again. So families rise and fall 
but hierarchical relations are perpetuated over time. In one way or another, they are a constant feature of human life. Revolutions like the Russian Revolution overturn one set of hierarchical relations and replace it with a new set. If this is right, then what is necessary from a left perspective is a steady or constantly renewed resistance. Historically, the classic agent of resistance to inequality is not the revolutionary party, but the insurgent movement, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, and on, I hope, to movements still to come. Successful or partial successful insurgencies make society more equal. But this kind of success, and indeed movement politics more generally, is only possible in a free society. And here is the crucial link between freedom and equality. Of course, freedom is itself a, a pleasure. It's a good thing to, f to feel free, to be in charge of your own life, to make personal decisions free of external coercion. But in the realm of politics, the value of freedom is collective and enabling. It makes it possible for men and women to join together to fight against oppression and to claim equal standing. Take political freedom away and equality becomes a lost project. The two go together. I believe that deep down we all understand this. And yet each new maximal leader who calls himself a leftist can count on sympathy and support from some parts of the left. And after years have passed and the brutalities of rev revolutionary regimes have faded from memory, we regularly get revisionist accounts of their commendable egalitarianism. And, and I guess that's understandable since the alternative politics that I'm describing, that I'm defending, is a story of victories and defeats. Freedom allows only a gradual approach to equality, and this approach is frequently interrupted. Two steps forward, two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes, as in recent years in my country, two steps back. <laughs> a free politics is often, for egalitarian activists, a frustrating experience. And frustration fuels the fantasy of a single brutal stroke that wins the day and ends the struggle. In fact, the struggle doesn't have an end. Egalitarianism is steady work, and political freedom is the necessary condition for its always incomplete achievements. Now, I'll turn to the other side. Commentators on the right would probably agree with my critique of the suppression of political freedom, but that's not what they are really interested in. They believe that any use of state power for egalitarian purposes, even if democratically warranted, is an attack on freedom, which is for them primarily, if not entirely, economic freedom. The freedom to make things and exchange them, to buy them and sell them, to lend and borrow, to pass material possessions onto your children or to give them away, these are the fundamental freedoms. In the emphasis the right places on the economic sphere, their thinkers approach a Marxist conception of social life, though exchange rather than labor, exchange rather than production, is for them the central and most valued human activity. But only ideologues really believe that there is a single human activity that defines who or what we are. Producing and exchanging are obviously important activities, but so are, for example, thinking and loving. These latter two also feature the tension between freedom and equality, and they can help us understand how it works. Freedom of thought and freedom in love clearly make for inequality. Some people get A's in school and some people don't. 
Some people understand string theory or critical theory or queer theory, and others don't. And these are only minor examples of the inequalities that thought produces. Similarly, some people get the love they want, and some people don't. That lovely woman ignores me, but is eager to run off with someone else. And this is only a minor example of the inequalities that love produces. And still, most of us don't favor the regulation of thought and love for the sake of equality. There are people who support regulation for the sake of ideological correctness or Puritan morality. But with regard to both thinking and loving, almost universally, we prefer freedom over equality. Right-wing intellectuals repeat this preference with regard to exchange. And when I dispute their preference, I may be arguing that exchange is not as central to our humanity as thought and love, but that's a deeper philosophical argument than I can reach to today. In any case, right-wingers in the interests of free exchange are stronger advocates than most leftists are of the withering away of the state. Now, actually, what they want is the withering almost away of the state, since they need, they need what they call a minimal state to enforce contracts, deal with fraud, prevent theft, and repress leftist insurrections. Beyond this, they are advocates of laissez-faire. They oppose any state interference in private, in economic life. And of course, political freedom, as I have described it, will lead to state interference whenever the left wins elections. Responding to this possibility, right-wingers seek a state that cannot be used for regulative or redistributive purposes because it doesn't have and isn't able to collect the necessary resources. Ideally, at least, they don't aim to abridge political freedom, though I will argue in a minute that they usually end up doing that. What they really want is to make politics irrelevant, the market dominant. The claim that the right-wing version of economic freedom is incompatible with equality is, is true. The general and universal tendency toward hierarchy is most clear in the economic realm where extended processes of exchange produce vast accumulations of wealth and desperate poverty and everything in between. But then for this very reason, economic freedom extended over time turns into its opposite. Indeed, one could say um, exchanges between a, a rich man and a poor man are never really voluntary. Exchanges um, of that sort are never voluntary. Indeed, one could say that they are never free at all and that the economic freedom of the successful regularly produces the economic unfreedom of the less successful manifest, for example, in what we used to call wage slavery. Theorists of economic freedom, like the American libertarian philosopher Robert Nozick, have acknowledged that the existence the, have acknowledged the existence of unfreedom in so-called free enterprise economies. Hence, Nozick once argued in a class that we taught together, which Astrid mentioned in her introduction, Nozick argued that since capitalism conceived as a system of genuinely free exchange, is a just economic order, a revolution to establish capitalism in the United States would also be just. But such a revolution, he didn't say, might well produce something more than a minimal state. And even if it led to a system of free exchange, the revolution would soon have to be repeated since free exchange, as I said a moment ago, regularly produces unfree exchanges when the owners of capital bargain with men and women who own nothing. To paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, one of the best of the American founders, I guess I should 
say the line I'm paraphrasing before I paraphrase it. Um, Thomas Jefferson said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of tyrants. And I was, will paraphrase that, the tree of economic liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of capitalists. The point of social democratic regulation is to avoid the need for blood. My argument now requires one further step. Just as political unfreedom gives rise to new social and economic hierarchies, so the hierarchies produced by economic freedom give rise to new forms of political unfreedom. Not the rule of a vanguard or maximal leader, but the rule of oligarchs or plutocrats. Wealth has many uses in the sphere of politics. To bribe state officials, to control the media through which political knowledge is transmitted, to pay the campaign costs of friendly politicians, to create well-funded organizations in civil society that are the opposite of countervailing, call them prevailing, they buttress the powers that be. Now, all this taken together makes for a pervasive corruption of democratic politics. The crucial response from the left is mass mobilization to set numbers against riches in the hope that given an open political arena, numbers will prevail. The oligarchs therefore aim, as they are now doing in my country, to reduce the numbers, to push as many people as possible out of the electorate. If nonetheless numbers prevail, leftists in power will regulate economic activity and try to reduce <coughs> inequality. Now, recall the claim of some leftists that only a very strong state can do that. Right-wing writers use the specter of an authoritarian regime to defend their version of economic freedom. They argue that the only alternative to the inequalities that the market produces is the kind of leveling produced by a tyrannical state. But they are wrong, in the same way that leftist defenders of tyranny are wrong. The state can regulate the economy in many different ways, from the eight-hour day to the five-year plan. Economic freedom can be constrained in ways that allow a lot of room for entrepreneurial activity and for exchanges that are really voluntary. And constraint itself isn't always the same thing. It doesn't always bring the full weight of state power to bear on individual men and women. Consider one standard right-wing libertarian argument that taxation forces the people taxed, you and me, to work so many days a year for the state. It's like the corvée of the old regime in France, which was literally a system of forced labor. But beware of the metaphor. Writing a check to the Internal Revenue Service, or whatever it's called here in France, is not at all like forced labor on a royal estate. The difference is a matter of experience, and it makes a big difference. It also makes a difference that forced labor, unlike taxation, is never designed and imposed through a democratic process. Military conscription is more plausibly compared to the corvée, though it too can be and should be subjected to democratic control. The virtue of redistributive taxation from the standpoint of economic freedom is that it assumes that freedom will produce inequality and allows that, but then corrects for the inequality it allows. It is a kind of post hoc regulation. We can regularly, re readily imagine pre hoc regulations that most of us would agree don't seriously restrict economic freedom. Child labor laws, factory safety laws, anti-monopoly laws. <laughs> None of these require a frightening degree of state power. There are two currently controversial forms of state regulation that are worth just a word here. 
The first is the effort to limit the role of wealth in political campaigns. And I've already said that the role of wealth in political campaigns is one source of plutocratic power. The United States Supreme Court in recent years has ruled that money spent in a campaign represents the speech of the donor and ought to be free. That it is actually an exchange of money for benefits to be received doesn't bother people on the right since exchange also ought to be free. But this is a clear case where even a modest equality, the chance, nothing more, to win an election requires some restriction of economic freedom. The second example of current contestation here in France has to do with labor codes that regulate factory or company discipline and make it difficult to fire employees. This may make, as it's claimed, um, for economic inefficiencies, but it is very important to say that at least initially, these um, labor codes are less a restriction on economic freedom than a remedy for economic unfreedom manifest in the arbitrary power of owners and managers. It might be better if work discipline and rules for hiring and firing were negotiated between company and union representatives rather than imposed by the state. But no such negotiations are possible without strong unions and pervasive unionization, both of which require, and at this moment obviously are not getting, support from liberal or social democratic governments. Think of the central role of the Wagner Act. Um, the Wagner Act in the United States passed in 1935, promoted collective bargaining and unionization and was vital to the development of industrial unions in the United States. The act definitely set limits on the power and therefore the freedom of corporate managers, but it greatly enhanced the freedom of workers in, for example, the steel and auto industries, and it made the United States
Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for, for, for being here and for coming to Sciences Po and, and, uh, and sharing this, this paper with us. And um, I, um, I have uh, three questions. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, uh, is very prosaic and, and contingent. Uh, I don't think it's frivolous, but it's, it's prosaic. And, uh, and the, the, the two other questions are more uh, theoretical and, and related also to, um, to other uh, parts of your, of your work. Um, so I was, um, in, in the current context, uh, I was very struck by <coughs> uh, your argument uh, uh, framed in terms of the difference between left and right. And, uh, uh, and it's a very sincere uh, question. I mean, uh, uh, as you know here, I mean, we are, uh, we're in a world beyond left and right. I mean, we are in the en marche world, Kadima. <laughs> And, uh, and so we have a young president who says, oh, left and right, and it doesn't matter anymore. And, uh, and also I have the feeling that some of the people from, who say that they are from the left, uh, who have gained a lot of uh, votes, I, I don't think that they would necessarily be your cup of tea. And, um, and so uh, my, my question is also an, uh, related to to the um, the water uh, the water project that you have here, and as Rick told me that you have a, it's part of a book on the foreign policy of, of the left, and uh, I, I would have liked to, to ask you uh, uh, about exactly what do you mean by this this foreign policy of the of the left in a current context where uh, the divide between left and right is very much uh, uh, challenged, and in a context where populist leaders are. Have been uh, have been elected, and also maybe more specifically, because <coughs> it's a very broad question, and I I was um, uh, I was wondering in this foreign part if we maybe uh, you could give us some hints about how to relate this foreign policy of the left to academia, because it, it's something that strikes me very much. I mean, that liberal states. Uh, wealthy liberal states where the, the level of academia is much higher than in other countries. Let's be honest, I mean, they can have you know, set some, some criteria according to which, yes, American universities are, are great universities, and, and the best evidence is that they have, they have you. But the, the paradox is, how come such a, uh, uh, a very fertile ground uh, a liberal society has produced uh, undecent leaders <coughs> as your president. There's a, there's a paradox here. I mean, he, for example, here in France, we're not exactly a liberal state, we are a republic, but we have elected a liberal president, so c'est le monde à l'envers. And I was, I was wondering exactly, I mean, what could be uh, a response on part of academia uh, from the left to uh, what is happening in terms uh, in terms of politics and the level of political leaders 
I mean, isn't, isn't there something strange uh, here? And, okay, so that was for the context. The second, um, my second question, which is actually divided into two questions, is um, uh, this paper shows very well uh, how uh, your, your frame uh, other articles or, or books, there is always, and this is something that captures the reader, there is always this tension. You make oppositions, divides, uh, it's dialectical. And, uh, and then, so we, we get in, in the Walter article, in the, in the Walter book, and, and then we try to find our way out. And sometimes it's difficult, but there's a lot of suspense, and we, we, we're there, you catch your reader. And, um, and also there's always, you know, uh, there are different spheres of justice, there are different types of war, the just war, the unjust wars, there are dilemmas, there are hands that are dirty, others that are not dirty, uh, there's universalism, relativism, they're thick, thin, wow. So I, I call this sort of uh, the Walzerian maze. And, uh, and we're there with, with, with freedom and equality. But in this Walserian maze, I would like to go back to, <coughs> to, um, to issues about war and just war. And um, I, uh, so needless to say, we have all read your book. And, uh, and uh, your book is a classic, and the best e evidence that it is a classic, <laughs> it is that it has been re-edited many times. And I have the 1992 edition. I didn't buy the other ones, I just have <laughs> this one. But I looked at the other ones and the foreword, it's, it's very interesting because you can see the evolution of war and you can see the evolution of, of the normative issues that are prevalent. So Vietnam, 1992, Gulf War, and then 2000, 2006, 2015. And uh, uh, I, I, I just, recently read the foreword of uh, the 2015 uh, edition, and uh, we're waiting for the next edition. But this, the last one, so this, this is the last sentence that you write. <coughs> uh, I mean, you're talking, of course, about issues of crimes of war and killing civilians and the fact that, of course, uh, you have to minimize harm in the context of uh, asymmetrical warfare. And this is your, I think your last <coughs> sentence, the anticipation of strong judgments will make asymmetrical warfare less likely. So that is, we, we, we are thinking about these normative issues, but we anticipate strong judgments about our current behavior. And this I find extremely interesting, and I, I, I am, um, it's, it's a maze, it's a puzzle. I, I've asked myself this question many times. Uh, I call this the Schiller effect, the tribunal of history. So, Weltgerichte, uh, Weltgeschichte, voilà. Uh, so, the world, hist world history is the world tribunal. But, so, you make a bold statement, you know, it's gonna make those wars less likely. Do you really think so? Uh, I, I'm being very honest, because some days I think yes, and some other days say no, there's too many other factors. But because here, the way you picture is that we have a sort of a super ego of the future. You have a, a super ego in the future that tells us what we should and, or we should not do. Posterity, we're worried about posterity. Maybe, but maybe if you could a little bit elaborate on, on, on this. The second, the, the second, no, so it's a, Okay, the second, uh, uh, so I'll skip the third question. So the second part of the second question <laughs> is about, uh, is about um, again, warfare. And uh, again, the, the, the tension, the maze, the realist and the legalist paradigm. And I, uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering what you think, I'm making it very short. I, I was wondering what you think about the tension between the national interest and global justice today we see how, you know, a American, how it played out. But we have countries such as China that are confronted 
in the very same moment exactly do the same kind of challenge. They want to pursue their national interests, they want to play the hard way, and they want also somehow to be part of this global justice thing. I mean, the, the only non-West, I mean, non-Western non book on the ethics of war that is being published is a, 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 a Chinese ethics of war handbook. And they're organizing conference on the global justice, and global justice and the national interest. So what do you think will be here the tension between these two goods, national interest and, uh, and, uh, and global justice, and can, they're not commensurable, but can they be compatible, especially in a non-Western context? Okay, I have another, another question. Maybe maybe the second now, would you like to collect the questions um, first? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> as much as we want. <laughs> so I, I will say something. Uh, these are, um, well, uh, questions that go beyond the, the, the talk today. I am um, very committed to continue writing about war. The reason there have been so many editions of my book is mostly because there have been so many wars. The publisher brings out a new edition for each war. I would be, in all honesty, I would be happy to go out of print. Um, I do believe that um, the, the judgments we make about the way wars are fought have an effect upon the ways wars are fought. And it's not posterity, it's the immediate judgments. One of the clearest um, ways to win an asymmetric war, and remember asymmetric wars are wars between a high-tech army and a low-tech insurgency, uh, like um, the US and Vietnam, or the US and, and the Taliban, or Israel and Hamas. Um, and in the long history of these wars, the high-tech army doesn't win. And the reason the high-tech army doesn't win is because the insurgency requires the high-tech army, the insurgency is fought in such a way as to require the high-tech army to kill civilians. And the more civilians it kills, the more likely it is to lose the war. Um, because public opinion is is one of the things that is being fought for. Legit public l legitimacy is one of the things that is being fought for in every asymmetrical war. If you can figure out a way to fight in an asymmetrical war, if the high-tech army can figure out a way to fight the high without killing civilians, it will win. Um, and so far, no of the high-tech armies has been terribly successful in, uh, in, in doing that. So, um, well, I, I, should, I, I should recognize that in Sri Lanka, there, there is a way of a high-tech army winning if you just kill enough people, if you kill and kill and kill, um, and if the world doesn't care or isn't watching. Um, but uh, for America's wars and for Israel's wars, the world is always watching and uh, killing civilians is a way to lose, uh, to lose the war. And I think that's a, that is something that has been absorbed by um, at least the, the, the strategists of the high-tech armies, though they haven't yet imposed new ways of fighting on their uh, soldiers. Um, uh, let me say something about, I, I don't believe uh, the, the left-right opposition has been transcended or escaped. Um, I was not at all sympathetic to uh, President Obama's uh, call for trans-partisanship. Uh, partisanship is an important part of uh, politics. And um, the left-right op opposition is, is n not only one of the most familiar, but it is, it is, it is a, um, a form of partisanship that actually represents real interests. Um, because the left, it, at its best, 
<coughs> represents the interests of the people in trouble in every society, the most vulnerable people. Um, op oppressed minorities, um, new immigrants, um, anybody in trouble, the, what we now call the, the precariat, which is the new uh, generation of, um, of people in trouble, of, um, of vulnerable people produced by um, an, a, an economy that is uh, destroying uh, the kinds of jobs that, that, that made people uh, able to, um, to, to work steadily and care for their uh, families. And, and this has happened in the academic world, by the way, as well as in, I don't know about the French situation, but in America, the great majority, the majority now, of teachers in our colleges and universities are not tenure track uh, professors or <coughs> assistant or associate professors. They are adjuncts, they are part time, they are without benefits, uh, they have no um, job uh, security. We have produced an academic proletariat, which is an important part of the precariat. And one of the reasons that Bernie Sanders achieved such extraordinary popularity among young people in the United States is because of the vulnerability of their economic um, position. The job of the left is to represent people in trouble and that job doesn't go away. Um, it is true that um, at this moment, something very strange has happened to the left-right dichotomy, which I can illustrate um, very briefly by describing two American towns. Um, I grew up for most of my um, childhood in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was a steel town. Bethlehem Steel was the, the main employer, virtually the only employer in uh, Johnstown. Um, when the union came to Johnstown, when the steel workers were organized in 1941, the town became firmly democratic. The steel mills started closing in the late 70s and 80s. Now they are gone. Uh, Johnstown has a population of about two thirds what it was in the 40s. And Johnstown voted two to one for Donald Trump. I now live in Princeton, New Jersey, which is one of the richest towns in the United States. <coughs> Princeton voted eight to one for Hillary. Uh, the social base of the Democratic Party is the upper middle class, <laughs> is the professional, the professional classes and the American minorities, blacks and Hispanics. Um, now you can win an election with that base, but it is um, very, very hard to win a leftist victory without the working class. And that is the current state of, um, of the American left and of other lefts. I, I suspect it, it may be true of the Socialist Party here uh, also. Um, and that's, uh, there is a big argument going on within the Democratic Party in the United States and it goes on among the academic who support the Democratic Party of whether to focus on regaining support in the, what is essentially the white working class um, or to focus on mobilizing the minorities um, uh, because uh, you can win an election with the um, upper middle class blacks and Hispanics in the United States today. But um, I'm not sure that is the way the left ought to go about winning an election. Anyway, um, I don't know exactly what you meant by the, well, the academy and the left. Um, political theorists like me have a license to defend political positions. That's what we do. Um, other academics are supposed to be objective, impartial, neutral. Uh, political theory does not require anything like that. Um, so uh, it, it is true the academy is leftist. Um, 
and you are also right that, a, that a certain kind of academic leftism is, is very unattractive to me. <laughs> um, it's too easy to decide that, um, as someone said, we'll give up, we'll give up trying to, um, to win state power and we will try to <laughs> instead take over the English department. <laughs> Uh, that's not a, an acceptable leftism. Uh, well, I think I should, we should hear from other. So thank you very much for uh, finally coming here and thank you for this very illuminating talk. Uh, I have only two questions and I will be very short because it's also important that the um, the people here, you, uh, can also talk. So first, uh, I was wondering when I uh, read your paper, but also when I read most of your books, why we should defend doubt and ambiguity and maybe skepticism as a political value. Because oh, in the... To uh, as a political value. Like why it's important to defend this uh, possibility of doubt and uncertainty. Because in your uh, text here, there is an echo on her oh. as a political value. Yes, you you want me to? The, yeah, maybe I can talk like that. Like that? It's better? Yeah, that's better, yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, because in the text. Get the other one away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we can put it down. Um, push it down. No. Don't oh. hold it. So yeah, so in the text you, you say that we should refuse to be clear uh, and that we should defend the people the, the right to refuse to be clear. And I believe that you have in this, this approach in your work that we should pre pre preserve this ambiguity and this idea that we are, we, we are not, you know, necessarily, we don't have to have a very uh, steady arguments about everything. And I was wondering, this this uh, approach to philosophy and also to politics, it's very appealing to me because I think that we live in a world of differences. And if we are very committed to pluralism, we need to, to let ourselves doubt from time to time. But still, I was wondering how we can have enough political strength to act if we live in this world of doubt. So sometimes we, we should also be clear. So I, I, uh, I wanted to know how we can uh, think of that. And when, when you talked about uh, left and, um, and uh, right, you know, today there is a lot of movement, uh, not only in the US, but also in France, of people who try to, um, to have transform transformative politics by overcoming traditional politics and by overcoming the state and the political party. And I have in mind Occupy Wall Street, uh, Nuit Debout in France, we also have Bazaar, a lot of, um, this type of movement, even the feminist uh, movement after the Weinstein uh, affair. And I was wondering if this, um, <coughs> this if, you, if you think that we can overcome the traditional politics, and if, we, uh, and if you think that this is a way to, to, to go and to reform left, left, actually, what is the left? And so my last question regarding to that is that if we think that uh, we should move from this ground you know, politics uh, with this idea of political party, left and right, and we should focus about here and now and what we can do here and now, then uh, what is the role of political theory? Like if we don't really need big uh, narrative and big, you know, thinking and ideology, actually, and you talk about the intelligentsia here in the text, so why do we need a uh, political theory and what is our task as political theorists? Small question. <laughs> Um, yes, I'll begin with the, with the alternative politics. Um, uh, and Occupy is a, is a, a, a very good example. Um, of course, Occupy was uh, in some ways standard left mm -hmm. um, politics. Uh, occupying, uh, sitting in at uh, lunch counters in the South was the beginning of the civil rights movement sitting in at auto factories in Detroit was the beginning of the um, organization of industrial workers. 
Um, so occupying Wall Street was was a, a continuation of that kind of um, of politics. Um, but Occupy failed in the United States, um, and it failed in part because it was too committed to alternative politics and not committed enough to, um, to real politics. Uh, I'll give you, uh, there was a very strong anarchist um, element in, uh, in Occupy. Um, one of my uh, friends um, uh, went uh, to the General Assembly. The General Assembly was the, um, the meeting of all the occupiers. Um, and someone at the General Assembly said, well, look, um, there are a few hundred of us here. We need more. We need to recruit more people. And somebody else jumped up and said, recruitment? That's a fascist idea. <laughs> um, and so there, there was very little recruitment. Um, and there was no, no one was willing to say, I want to be a leader of this movement. I want to be one of the leaders. Choose me to represent you. Um, the movement had no, no leaders. Or if it had leaders, the leaders were hiding so that they weren't accountable to the people they claimed to speak for. And this is a disastrous politics. Uh, it, the, the Occupy movement left no institutional residue because to build an institution, you have to recruit and you have to have a, some kind of cadre of, um, of, 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 of leaders who are accountable to the others. Uh, none of that was, was produced and it was quite, and there was a willful refusal to produce it. Um, so finally, yes, we need, we need politics outside of the electoral system. We need mass movements. We need sit-ins and occupations. Um, but the goal has to be to win state power because without the, the state remains the, the crucial agent of political change, of welfare, of public education, of, um, of, of every, of, of labor rights, of, you, you cannot act effectively in the world today without using state power. And if you start in the streets, as we will often have to start, the goal has to be to win elections. The goal has to be to uh, a democratic seizure of power. Um, doubt and worry. Um, yes. Uh, um, I, I am, and, and the role of political theory, I, I have a long-standing quarrel with the German critical theorists who believe that it is necessary to have a theory, a big <laughs> theory. Um, and that comes out of the <coughs> Marxist uh, past. Um, I still remember at, this, at board meetings of the magazine Descent that I wrote for and helped to edit, I remember some of the old timers who grew up in the Marxist movements who, when we were talking about a, a strike in Detroit, would begin with the division of labor in ancient Babylonia and move forward until they um, got the correct ideological position about the strike in Detroit, which we all knew they were in favor of before they started talking. So um, I. Uh, I don't believe that we need that kind of a theory in order to be politically engaged, politically um, active. We need, we need smaller theories. We need theories about how things work. We need theories about, um, about uh, how society is organized and how it functions. We need theories about how to uh, mobilize um, uh, uh, people. Um, we don't need the whole, the big thing. Um, we need 
very strong moral commitments. Um, and we need some uh, accounts of how things work in the world. Um, and with those two, we can do, I think, everything that we need, uh, that we need to do. Okay, well, I'm being original. I'm gonna have two questions, I'm really sorry. But um, I'll skip the, what an honor it is to be here because it's an honor, but we'll take that for granted. So my questions really concern two values that political theorists, I think, are often shy of talking about or discussing, but which seem critical to the democratic left, especially for those of us persuaded by your critique of revolutionary beliefs. Well, as you note, the deck is stacked against the democratic left, given appalling inequalities. So there's a standing temptation, that's the one that underlies your argument, there's a standing temptation to look for revolutionary rather than democratic solutions to our problems. But the trouble is there's also another standing temptation, and that is to give up, and therefore to look for individual solutions to play the system in order to protect your family and yourself. And so my question really is, what can political theory tell us about hope as a political value? and the ways to distinguish it from delusion and fantasy. And I figure if anyone should know about it, it should be you, because being a democratic socialist in America, you must have <laughs> confronted this problem many, many times. And then if there's still time, I'd like to ask you a related question. Namely, what does your argument imply about the challenges of democratic solidarity? Given that solidarity often seems as much an obstacle as a support or realization, for freedom and equality. And if we're really unlucky, solidarity often seems to be a substitute for, is promised as a substitute for, rather than the realization of leftist hopes of reconciling liberty and equality. So hope and solidarity. Hmm. <laughs> um, well, there is a, um, fairly easy argument against uh, giving up, and that is the, the radically unexpected ways in which things happen in political life. Um, change comes suddenly, and it comes without the um, experts um, warning us um, most of the, of the profession of Sovietologists did not anticipate 1989. I don't know any of the Arabists in um, the United States, in the Academy or in the State Department, who expected uh, the Arab Spring. And then when, it, when the Arab Spring began, they were extremely far more optimistic than they had any right mm -hmm. to be. Um, so I, you, you can live in hope <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. simply because political change comes um, so often and so, so suddenly. Um, but of course, it does, left politics does require a certain kind of, um, of stubbornness. Um, and it also requires a certain kind of, um, of irony um, for, for which, which is exemplified in a an, in an, uh, very old Jewish joke about a man in a Polish shtetl, a little Polish uh, village who was appointed to sit outside the entrance to the village and watch for the Messiah. Some say so that the Messiah wouldn't ignore this tiny village, and some say to give the people warning so that they could get ready uh, for the coming of the Messiah. And a friend asked this man, well, what kind of a job is that? And he said, well, it doesn't pay very well, but it's steady work. <laughs> you know, the left, the politics of the left is steady work. 
and you have to you have to undertake it knowing <laughs> that the um, the the messianic kingdom, the communist society, the end of history is not coming, but that things can be an awful lot better than they are for an awful lot of people, and that is our job. So solidarity, I'm not sure in what way solidarity conflicts with um, politics. I, Well, it's sort of like the Obama, you know, the appeals to solidarity. We know from feminism, there are appeals to, to transcend your personal interest, to see a greater thing. I mean, Perry Anderson was constantly telling women and everyone else that they should wait for the revolution. You know, solidarity required you to put everything else on hold. Oh. And so there is, in a sense, a real challenge about what is the place of solidarity once on a vision that wants to reconcile liberty and equality. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, right, well, but solidarity with um, Perry Anderson's vanguard. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it would certainly view. not justify any, any member of the working class or, or any woman or any minority member, any black or Hispanic in America. Uh, giving up the political struggle and waiting for the revolution. Um, that's not uh, what I would think solidarity means is a, um, a commitment to, um, to listen to and to work with uh, people in trouble. Um, let me g think of some examples. Um, during the green uprising in Iran. Um, you may remember, uh, uh, there's no reason for you to remember the American response. President Obama responded very weakly because he was engaged in negotiations on the nuclear treaty and didn't want to endanger those negotiations. Uh, neocons attacked him very harshly for not speaking strongly in favor of the people in the streets, Tehran and other cities. And uh, the left, the response of the left was to support Obama. The United States should say nothing, do nothing. And that was the full extent of the left's response. Now, um, What I mean in my new book by a foreign policy for the left is not only what we should say about what our country should do, but what we should do. And what the Iranian uprising required from us was um, pickets in front of every Iranian embassy, a mass marches and demonstrations in support of the, um, of the uprising, um, our magazine should be listing arrested, the names of arrested dissidents in the hope of keeping them alive. That's what solidarity with the uprising would have meant. Um, in 2011, when uh, Obama announced the withdrawal from Iraq, which we, the American left, supported since we opposed the war and we wanted withdrawal <coughs> At that very moment, a group of Iraqi feminists appealed to the United States to stay for a little longer until the sectarian violence directed against them was, they said, controlled. Um, now, the American left is not prepared to have the American army control anything. Um, and so there was no response at all to that demand. No, it, now, maybe, maybe American leftists should not have advocated postponing the withdrawal, but we ought to have been listening to those Iraqi women and engaged, and if we were not going to support withdrawal, we had to give them reasons why we were doing it, and that's <coughs> another example of what left solidarity requires. 
um, Jeremy Corbyn, when he was a backbencher, called for the withdrawal of um, Britain from NATO. And it never occurred to him to ask leftists in Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, what they thought about the withdrawal of Britain from NATO. They would have told him no. Um, but he never thought to ask. He calls himself an internationalist, but he is a parochial Brit. And that's not what the left should be. Left internationalism requires a solidarity with leftists around the world. With, and that doesn't always mean doing what they tell us to do, but it means engaging with them and listening to them and, and, and talking with them. So that kind of solidarity, I think, is what we should be uh, looking for. Okay, I'm trying again. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you. I'm Simon Reich. I, uh, I teach at Rutgers in New Jersey, and before that I lived in Pennsylvania, so I'm familiar with your cultural references to both towns very well. And that prompts a question, um, and I, I hope it's, you know, you, you gave your characterization between the left and the right, between freedom and equality, and I understand the limits of generalizations like this. But what really struck me very powerfully when you were describing left revolutionaries, the language that you used, and unfortunately I don't have a copy, so I'm, I can't recall the exact language. But as you talked about things like you know, a disregard for the rule of law and the revolutionary aspects and breaking down conventions and institutions. And what really struck me so powerfully was, well, that seemed like a standard characterization of Trump. So I'm, I'm just curious. Um, it prompted that you know, you're interested in practice. I, I just teach IR, so we're those people. We don't do normative, and we don't, you know, we try and focus on causality and avoid prescription. But, but I just wanted wondered how you characterize that divide, given the nature of politics. You were asked about alternative politics, but in the context of electoral politics in the United States, it seems the categories that you describe, at least nominally, are breaking down. Um, I'd also just add very parenthetically your comment about why we, why irregular armies win wars uh, from, from an IR perspective. The answer is very different. The answer is because the weaker side in asymmetric conflicts are fighting for existentially, for their existence. That was the lesson we learned from Vietnam to Afghanistan. The Taliban thinks they're fighting for their lives and we're not willing to give our lives. And that's nothing to do with civilian casualties. That's got everything to do with the cost that we're willing to bear. Um, well, the, the, what I was arguing about asymmetric wars is not um, the motivation of the insurgents, but um, the response of the rest of us. And we are not responding to their um, existential uh, feelings. We are responding. To the civilian, to, to their civilians, to their ki murdered or killed civilians, that's where that's the response, and that's um, that is why the the um, the politics, that is why the insurgents win political victories, even when they cannot win a military victory. Um, I I I I don't think. Um, I, it's, you're suggesting a comparison between Donald Trump and, um, and Lenin. Um, I, 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 I still believe, although I understand the threat to um, constitutional uh, government in the United States, I still believe that we can vote him out of office. Um, whereas uh, that was not possible in um, the new Soviet Union in the 1920s or 30s or 40s. Um, 
democratic government is endangered by demagogues, and demagogues <laughs> are um, are on the on the right not so different from populist leaders on the left, um, and they have to be opposed um, in in very similar uh, in similar ways. Um, so I study international. Uh, international relations and international could, affairs. Could you stand up, please? Sure. sure. So I study international relations and international affairs, so I'm also interested in the notion um, of international um, social justice and equality. And I was wondering what you think of the, um, of the notion that social justice domestically and equality domestically implies injustice um, internationally. And just to contextualize this question, in Europe, we are traditionally very inward looking. We have a welfare state, we have an emphasis on equality, and that has been seen to justify relatively coercive policies in terms of border control and the externalization of border practices um, and protectionism, for example. And those policies are precisely arguably what hinders development internationally. Um, and that's, it is what I would argue hinders um, equality among states internationally. So is that a weakness of the left? Is that a weakness of social democracy that we do not emphasize international um, international equality and only focus on domestic equality? And do we, and I'm a social, I, I identify myself as a social democrat, so do we have to accept that libertar libertarians just have much stronger arguments in that respect in promoting the four freedoms of capital, uh, people, uh, goods and services? Um, is that something that we have to cede to libertarians or do you think that there is a valid social democratic argument for international um, equality among states? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, you, I think one of the um, hardest issues now facing the left is the, starts from the fact that the only uh, political space within which we have been able to win victories is the, the state. Um, and we have not discovered a, um, a political space in international society where we can mobilize or agitate. Um, there have been efforts um, in, uh, as in Seattle in 99, there, um, there have been demonstrations at Davos, but there, we have not discovered a way of, of mobilizing um, uh, people outside of the the state, uh, and um, and that means that at this moment, the um, the effort to achieve greater equality in international society is has to, that effort has to take place in in every state, and it encounters the the difficulties you are describing because there seem to be conflicts of interest between the well-being of, um, of workers in developed industrial countries um, and any kind of ameliorative efforts um, addressing hunger, poverty, or simply inequality uh, globally. Um, and we, we need to find ways of addressing that issue. Um, one of the ways, which has had some support in the labor movement, is to um, insist in, um, when we are negotiating trade treaties, to insist on um, the right of workers to organize in the countries with which we are trading. Um, in fact, under Obama, uh, rules of that kind were written into various trade agreements, but without any serious enforcement mechanism. And without enforcement, it's, it's meaningless. Um, one proposal by an American leftist economist is um, for a different kind of tariff than the one that Trump is advocating. Uh, his suggestion is that we should impose penalties on goods produced, on imported goods produced in countries that repress labor unions. 
Um, and that's, a, that's something that should appeal to American workers because repressing labor unions in China, say, makes the goods they produce cheaper than what can be produced here. And um, some recognition of that fact is um, uh, you could call a leftist version of a, um, of a, a tariff policy. And it, it, if, if followed um, in other, with other kinds of, um, of moves, um, it, it could produce some sense of solidarity with workers across borders and it could begin to make a difference um, in the way um, workers are treated in, in countries that now treat them very badly. But I, I agree, this is a, we, we haven't resolved this, this problem. And right now, anyone who claims to transcend the nation state, anyone who believes in abolishing borders, um, uh, abolishing borders is a very popular position among liberal and leftist political theorists and philosophers, and, and I can't understand that. A borderless global society means the free movement of capital, commodities, and labor um, around the globe, and that is a, par a capitalist paradise. It's not, um, it's not a leftist agenda. At, at, at all, um, we are we are for the moment living in and and only succeeding in and not succeeding very well at this moment in in the state, and so the the transcendence of the state is to my mind not um, not a good idea. Um, in fact, I think we should be arguing for the completion of the state system. We should be arguing for states for the Kurds and the Palestinians, and we should be arguing for decent states and strong states in Africa and Asia, because the state defends its people, and there are too many people who are not being defended. Um, so we have, a, we have this paradoxical position. We are internationalists who support and can only operate in um, the, the, the nation state. Thank you very much. Ones, yes, okay. So I just wanted to know, um, to what extent do you think can a state still guarantee labor protection and the welfare state um, I, in a globalized world? Speak slowly, please. Okay, sorry. Um, to what extent or uh, how much can a state still guarantee labor protection in a globalized world? Because, um, for example, um, capital can uh, can move um, more easily than labor to other states, and uh, there's also the risk of outsourcing. So to what extent do you think uh, can we still have um, effective labor protection in a welfare state in a globalized world? Um, well, look, we, we, um, we have to defend our fellow citizens. Um, and we are, um, we, sh we should be imposing, th this has been argued for in the United States for many years unsuccessfully, we should be imposing uh, penalties on um, factory owners who abandon uh, their factories and their workers or who take the factories to um, some other country where they don't have to pay. Um, union wages. Um, it, it is possible to to restrict the movement of um, of capital as we restrict the movement of commodities, and um, and some effort has to be made uh, to do that. Um, I guess there was a sense in which. Uh, um, old-fashioned capitalists were tied to their country and had at least some interest in common with their fellow citizens while the, the owners and managers of multinational corporations have no loyalties of that, of that sort. Um, and, and 
there are, there are good reasons to impose constraints on multinational corporations to control or abolish tax havens in odd places in the Caribbean or in um, some place in uh, some uh, island off the coast of Africa where suddenly their corporations appear earning vast amounts of money and being taxed hardly at all. Um, there have to be ways of controlling that, and I think there are ways for these multinational corporations, even if they feel no responsibility to the citizens of Britain, France, or the United States, can be that we can impose responsibilities on them since they do a significant part of their business in our countries. I don't think we need to accommodate um, we need to restrain and, and regulate um, global capitalism. And um, as I said in answering the previous question, the major task of the left is to figure out how to mobilize people for that project. Yeah, so my question is, uh, yeah. Um, so my, my question is, uh, do you think the main reason freedom and equality are seen in opposition opposition to each other because of the um, the Cold War indoctrination? Uh, for example, in the U.S., I think uh, Bernie Sanders was uh, labeled by his opponents oftentimes as an American because he wanted a uh, welfare state. Uh, the notions of universal well, well, uh, health care or free public education are seen as an American. And I think it echoes the Cold War indoctrination. In Russia, people don't necessarily care about freedom. I think Putin is proof of that. They don't care about political freedom, uh, maybe not even uh, freedom of uh, expression. And he's going to get uh, the elections this week. I mean, they are a formality for extending his mandate. Uh, so you have the notions being seen in opposition. And I think it might be because of the uh, propaganda or the rhetorics of, uh, of the Cold War. And it seems to me that 89 and 2014 might be an intermission of the Cold War. Uh, sometimes people li like to say that Cold War started again, and it's not a question. So the main question, if you think it ha if the opposition between the two notions has roots in the Cold War rhetorics, and I, I, I'd be, I'd like to know your opinion about the, the current relations, and do you think they might, ver it, can, it can be seen as a new Cold War? I mean, this week Theresa May ousted several, Rus several Russian diplomats, so this divide between West and East seems to be uh, uh, appearing again. Okay, okay. We will even collect the last questions. There was one in, in the back and two here. But really super short, please, because in principle we stop at seven. Okay, but here. Short. Uh, two short questions. No, 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 one. You get one. One. one short question. <laughs> right, okay. So. Uh, Oh. It, was a, it was a question actually about the topic of conversation that you, you were presenting, so on the maximal leader. Hi. On the maximal leaders, come, come up. Come, come up. Oof. On the maximal leader, so. Mm. <laughs> oh, no, no. I wrote it down so that it's brief. Um, so the maximal leader allows for a focal point in the orientation of a political movement, right? Uh, the maximal, I not the allows for a focal point in Okay. Hello. Okay. So the maximal leader allows for a focal point in the orientation of a political movement, right? Um, and so one of the logics behind this is that an exchange of a portion of freedom of the population for the maximal leader's capacity to direct and orient the political movement. So my question is, without this physical embodiment of a leader, or at least an image of a leader, how does a political movement orient itself? Thank you. Nice and short. 
Thank you. I want to follow up on Annabelle's question about hope. On the one hand, you, you drew an analogy with um, hoping for the Messiah, and the change you were hoping for, you said, can come unexpectedly. And, um, and on the other hand, you, you are under no illusions about, about um, the object of that hope, the revolutions, or the big sea change, or the big, the big sudden change that changes everything. You know that this, you, un, you reject this kind of hope. So if, if change comes slowly and you know, incrementally through democratic procedure and activism step by step, how, how does that image of change go with that image of hope that you introduced to us? I don't understand it. Thank you. One last one. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I wanted you to talk a little bit about, if you can, about this new concept of illiberal democracy oh. and what, what is this illiberal democracy, yes, yes, yes. Uh, whether that includes the current United States or not, I'll leave it up to you uh, to decide, and this uh, standing of freedom and equality in this new landscape. Would you, for example, subscribe to the view that since these are democracies and the rise of populist nationalist movements uh, in part of Europe, in the US, came about in a democratic way. Uh, could, would you subscribe to the view that perhaps a uh, majority of voters in these countries are no longer interested uh, either in freedom or in equality? Is, is this a new paradigm that's emerging? Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, in, in order then, I, I, um, I don't know what exactly to say about the Cold War. I, taking my, um, um, taking my, my beginnings from um, East European and, and Soviet dissidents, I would argue that the Cold War was a, a just war, although as in all wars, there were war crimes or um, uh, uh, serious um, mistakes and, and serious wrongs uh, in the course of the Cold War. On, from the US side, it was supporting authoritarian regimes <clears throat> and trying to, um, to uh, 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 creating an, an American right which treated every, every form of left politics as the beginning of the slippery slope toward uh, totalitarianism. Um, but, but basically, I think that um, it was a good thing that uh, the West won um, the Cold War. And of course, that does force us all to think about um, the post Cold War regimes in Eastern Europe, um, which have, which are now turning into um, illiberal democracies, and populist uh, populism seems to be uh, um, even stronger there than in France or in the United States. Um, and there do seem to be a lot of people, uh, as there were in the late 20s and 30s, um, hostile to parliamentary constitutional democracy and looking for some quick fix um, on, the, on the right. Um, and I don't know um, that I, we need to produce a, a political soci sociological analysis of how that happened. Uh, it had a lot to do with, I think, the um, the, the, the rapid introduction of a laissez-faire economy without any protections um, for uh, people in these countries. But um, we need to, to have a social and political analysis, and then we need to oppose uh, <laughs> this kind of, um, of politics. If people, are, if, if people are voting for it, then we have to give them reasons to vote against it. And I don't... Um, I, I'm not sure I have anything more to say than, uh, than, than, than that. But there are people in Hungary, in Poland, who are opposed to, who are um, 
social democrats, socialists, democratic socialists. We need to be in touch with them. We need to be asking them how can we help. Um, and I don't, I don't think they will have easy answers. Um, so what should we be hoping for when we engage in these political struggles? Um, I, uh, I once um, wrote a book um, about the biblical book of Exodus, the Exodus from Egypt, the long march to the promised land. Um, and uh, the march was, what was the hope that guided the march? Well, there was <coughs> an ideological hope uh, to become a nation of priests and a holy people. And there was a material hope to, to get to a land of milk and honey. Um, I am strongly in favor of the material hope. <laughs> uh, and um, I, in, in that book, I tried to describe what the left should aim for using Exodus language, and that is a better place than Egypt. A better place than Egypt. That's the hope. Um, and it, it, it can, it, it, you can express it in utopian terms so long as you aren't ideologically committed to the realization of that utopia at any cost, because that is where um, left politics goes, goes bad. Um, so a better place than Egypt. The maximal leader. Um, I, I am strongly in favor of leaders. I'm just not in favor of maximal <laughs> leaders. I don't think we need maximal leaders, and I don't think they serve our interests. We give them too much. We give up too much. They take too much. And they don't um, deliver, because what they are most concerned with is the maintenance of their own maximal power. Um, the, 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 most, the famous maximal leaders are the South American populists, like uh, Juan Piron or Hector Chavez. And we, they, they, take, they take state power. They take the state budget, and they distribute it to their followers until the money runs out. They don't build an economy. Um, they don't invest in public education or research. Um, they are concerned with their own power, and their power depends on the distribution of, literally, they are buying, they are buying their power. And that's not a form of democratic leadership. It's not, the, it's not a form of leadership that is genuinely accountable to people who need to be able to ask, not only, what are you doing for me today? What are you putting in my pocketbook? But what are you building for our children? What are you building for our grandchildren? And that's an answer that, that maximal leaders have never, have never given. They've never answered questions like that because they are not accountable um, in, in a way that requires them to answer those questions. And we have to, and if we insist on accountability, we will have leaders who are, who are democratic leaders. That means not maximal leaders. Thank you very much. <laughs>